Looks like I've got Odon in full puff. How are you doing, Odon? Sorry to disturb you. Your, <laughs> <laughs> your repose. Okay. We're back again with some more questions. We have a lot more to go through. And here's one concerning the Quran again, Odon. And this has uh, been a real stigler, the satanic verses. Uh, and over and over again, uh, Muslims have, 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 have tried to defend the satanic verses. But people have come up and say, where is the origin of the satanic verse and what's the controversy about it? Now, we're not talking about Samu Rushi's book called the satanic verse. We're talking about the, um, Odon, these are the verses that are in chapter 53, verse 19 and 20. Uh, if you, and the question comes up by a person named Cam Camera K. I don't know if that's a female or a male uh, who asked this question. Mr. LaFontaine, what is your opinion on the satanic verses if you say that no or, or there's no none or there's a lack of evidence of paganism in the seventh century arabia what about these verses because this is mm -hmm. certainly paganism how would you answer that one here and kind of give us some background because i understand you have some actually some new information that we need to hear concerning really what the satanic verses are exactly well, what are the satanic verses um you see in surah 53 there are two verses um, verse 19 to 20. Have you thought of Allah and Al Uza and Manat the third, the other? Those are supposed to be the satanic verses, but the real part of the, sat the satanic part of it has been taken out from the Quran by, um, by the scribes uh, during the, um, the ninth, maybe the 10th century. Because what we see in the Islamic tradition, and it is, uh, it is not a secret, uh, it is that at the beginning there was, um, there was another phrase. And this is the satanic phrase, the satanic uh, verse per se. And it is uh, here for everyone to read on the Wikipedia page of the satanic verse. Uh, satanic verses let me while he's looking it up just to just to, so people can find it don't put the satanic verses because that will take you to Samuel Rushdie's book just put satanic verses in Wikipedia exactly. and it'll take it right to where Odun is showing you so um, this is the verse in question have you thought of Alat and Aluza and Manat the third the other these are the exalted Haranik which means deities goddesses these are the exalted goddesses whose intercession is hoped for. This is the satanic part. We find it uh, in the Islamic tradition, early biographies of Muhammad by Al-Waqidi, Ibn Sa'ad, Ibn Ishaq, and also the tafsir of Al-Tabari. But we don't find it anymore in the Quran because it has been taken out of it because it was satanic. So the question here is always the same. This is um, this has to do with the process of um, making Islam out of something that was not Islamic at the beginning. You see, from the Islamic narrative point of view, Muhammad is supposed to give the Islamic revelation. So Muhammad, as a divine prophet, cannot say something that is not Islamic. He cannot uh, urge the people who are listening to him to worship goddesses. And this is why the Islamic narrative at first invented the idea to explain in an Islamic fashion this verse. It invented the idea that Muhammad at the time was possessed, possessed by Satan himself. And so he was not giving the revelation, but he was giving a satanic verse. But this is all due to the Islamic narrative preconceived idea that Muhammad is giving the divine revelation. When we look at the text for what it is, without this Islamic concept in mind, what do we see exactly? We see a preacher who is making a sort of mockery of an Arabic belief 
into Alat, Alusa, and, and Manat. He's mocking, he's mocking his audience by telling them, ha ha ha, Alat, Alusa, Manat, ha ha. So, uh, those are exalted de deities. Really, you should intercede. Uh, um, really, you should uh, intercede. You should pray to them. But this is a mockery, in fact. This is not. Um, but this is not a divine revelation. This is only a preacher who is mocking a sort of a remnant of pagan belief in his audience. But this this cannot be. This cannot be part of an Islamic narrative. And you see why the Islamic narrative was very troubled by this verse, because this verse does not fit the narrative. In the Islamic narrative, Muhammad is not supposed, supposed to mock, he's not supposed to make fun of his audience, he's supposed to give a very serious divine revelation. And here we see that it is not a serious divine revelation, this is just a preacher mocking an audience about, um, I think it, it is not really a pagan belief per se, and a pagan, um, and a pagan um, pertaining to a pagan religion, but I think it has, it has to do with a remnant of an old paganic, pagan belief, as we see it everywhere um, in in people who, who had been recently Christianized. Here, I have to make the point that during the seventh century, all Arabs had been Christianized, especially, for example, the Arabs of Petra. In Petra, we still find traces of the deities Alat, Alusa, and Manat, but Petra was, at the, during the seventh century, a Christianized city. There was a bishop there. So it was not, I think, an orthodox bishop with the, the it was not, um, I think it was a bit monophysite, maybe, maybe, but it's not the issue here. The issue is that all Arabs had been Christianized, but like every other people on earth who had been Christianized from a pagan background, some pagan uh, stuff remained. Uh, some people worshipped holy places, People worshipped holy rivers or holy sources, for example. And, um, and here they kept on having a sort of knack for uh, their former deities, Alat, Alusa, and Manat. And this is what the preacher is mocking. And you see here how the standard Islamic narrative was made. It was made from texts that were not Islamic per se, that did not tell the story of Muhammad giving the divine revelation. It was something else. But from those texts, they were forced to make something Islamic. And this very verse could not fit into an Islamic narrative. So at first it was in the Quran, but it was so devious, so un-Islamic, that they had to invent the story of Satan inspiring Muhammad, because otherwise it would destroy the narrative. Okay, so... You get my point, Jay. Yeah, and I, I think I do. I'm not so sure I'm convinced of it to, uh, completely, but that's fine. Uh, I, I don't see why Muhammad could not have mocked them if this is considered to be... Uh, if this was considered to be something worthy of mocking, because it is paganism, I, all the way through the Quran, we see confronting paganism over and over and over again. This would be another example of confronting it. Why then would they have to lift this part of the verse out? Uh, that I'm not convinced in. Maybe because because of the of the meaning of the um, satanic verse in itself. Because if we suppose that this is an Islamic Muhammad who is preaching. Why would an Islamic Muhammad compel his audience to worship pagan deities? Because this is what it means. These are the exalted deities whose intercession is hoped for. Okay, so you're saying that he's accepting these as pagan, as, as deities. Okay. A an Islamic Muhammad could not say this yeah, because yeah. it would be un-Islamic. Yeah. He, would, he would compel his audience into uh, worshipping uh, pagan deities. This, this cannot take place in the, in the standard Islamic narrative. This is not possible. Yeah, it, this it, is why it, they have everything we know about the Muhammad. Yeah. Because if, if he is, and this confronts 
this conf- if, if Muhammad is the the prophet who confronts shirk all the way through the Quran, how would you allow? How can you allow this verse to be in there where he is actually committing shirk? This is committing shirk. Exactly, this will contradict Islam. Yeah. This will make uh, Muhammad into um, a pagan prophet or, or or someone who was not a strict monotheist. So just to, will... just to be clear, just so everybody gets it, at one point this was in there. It was in the earliest Quran. It is obviously a an example of shirk and Muhammad, who is against shirk, against idolatry, all the way through the Quran, against paganism. He only believes in one God. They had to lift this part of the verse out. Unfortunately, they didn't lift the whole thing because that's the three goddesses are still named there. These are Nabataean goddesses, Al Uzza and actually Al At are actually the same goddess. One is a generic name of the her formal name, and so therefore they had to create a narrative to explain that. And in this mm-hmm. context, they are the way they explained see, it, he was the, by Satan. In the creation of the narrative, there were two steps. The first step was to qualify this verse as being sat- satanic, as being from Satan. The first explanation that the standard Islamic narrative gave to this uh, verse, these are the exalted deities whose intercession is up for, is by saying that it was Satan himself who inspired Muhammad. This was the first explanation. And this explanation was not up to the task. And uh, it was easier to, to get rid of this verse, to, to erase it from the Quran, uh, in order to, to, to make the standard Islamic narrative more coherent, more Islamic. So we have an example here of the process. At first, we invent a narrative. The narrative is not good enough. So we invent something else. We raise the verse and we we we, we try to, to 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 make the story vanish to 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 bury the story and when salman rushdie wrote about the satanic verses in his book um his main fault was to have unburied to have uh, uncovered the story such a story of the um, should should not exist and and i think the the most um the 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 most serious offense to islam was not um talking about a satanic verse but was talking it was about um uncovering the process of the making of the standard islamic narrative such a process should remain hidden, buried. No Muslim should um, question the standard Islamic narrative and its authenticity. No Muslim should then think that the standard Islamic narrative was um, was a process. Yeah. Uh, it's interesting because what you brought up are two problems simultaneously. I don't know if you've, uh, if you've noticed this. Not only does this prove that this is this is a manipulation by man written in its full form causing shirk because here is the prophet actually giving uh giving allegiance and lifting up these goddesses to be praised uh or or intercession to be used for intercession and only that which only god could give he's not giving to these pagan goddesses that's a problem in and of itself but in in, in exiting exact ex- eradicating that process they they have uh, they have they have to have explain it and so what they do by explaining it that he was seducted by Satan they've created mm-hmm. another problem and this is an even bigger problem and that is if he is a prophet of God how can he be seduced by Satan and not only that what else was he seduced by what other things have been excised out of the Quran that sh- that were there previously but had to be thrown out so it shows it's written by man it shows that Muhammad is fallible and sec- thirdly. We're not even sure that we've got the whole Quran here, but proving that Muhammad is as weak as you and me, and he's no longer a model for all of mankind, they have created an even harder problem. That needs to be sublimated. So when Salman Rushdie wrote his book with that name, that caused an enormous amount of frustration uh, all over the Muslim world because this this problem should have remained private. This is something, again, like like uh, Yasser Qadi said, we don't talk about this in public. This is not mm-hmm. something you bring out and don't film me on it. Talk about to me. Talk about this like later. This, when is, we're this in is not wise. This, this is, is not, not wise. wise. Thank mm-hmm. you for that. I think you've answered the question. This has been good for us to hear the background. 
it's fascinating. Uh, you, for those of you who don't believe what Odon said, just go on Wikipedia. It's all there. And there are reference after reference. Wakiti talks about it. Isham talks about it. Uh, so does Al-Tabari talk about it. So some of the biggest names in the standard Islamic narrative all refer to this verse. It was well known. It has been well known for over a thousand years. What Salman Rushdie did is just bring it out into the open so we could look at it. And uh, that confronts the, the whole idea of preservation of the Quran. It also confronts Muhammad's infallibility or his uh, ability to, uh, to be able to stand uh, without error. And it looks like he was full of error, but then Muhammad had nothing to do with it. It's those who first had it there in the Quran should never have had it. It had to be lifted out probably by the ninth or 10th century. It had to have happened by before the ninth or 10th century because it's in the ninth and 10th century that they're showing they're showing the other part of the verse that was lifted. Good stuff. Thank you so much. You've done a big, great help. And I think you've answered the question uh, for our good friend, Kamara at K. God bless you all who have been watching. This is Odom and Jay. Over and out. Thank you.